No, this is not a scene from the five o'clock traffic on the Broadway extension. It's a scene from The Road Warrior, a violent, suspenseful, bloody, and at times gut-wrenching film. This is a sequel, more or less, to the Australian film Mad Max. The Road Warrior starts with Max, played by Mel Gibson, wandering around on the highways looking for fuel. The period of time is after a massive war has left nothing but ruins and destruction and people to match. The precious commodity is gasoline. Fuel, go-go juice, well, you get the idea. The day-to-day -day routine consists of looking for food and fuel. Max and his faithful dog get involved with a group of people protecting a remote oil refinery. Now, this outpost, it seems, is always under attack from a bloodthirsty and fuel-thirsty gang. This hideous, horrifying horde is led by Humongous, played by J.L. Nelson. Girls, you would not like to take this guy to the prom, if you get my drift. After some major battles wherein the Humongous destroys Max's car and kills his dog, Max agrees to help the people in the outpost. They believe to survive, they must escape to a distant land by the sea. Now, with Bruce Spence as the pilot of a gyrocopter, Max drives the massive tank truck through the gates into the horde anxiously waiting. And we, the audience, see one last gigantic chase. tell you how it ends, it'll give too much away. The thing that sets this film apart from other car chase movies is realism. The non-stop sequence of crashes, smashes, and collisions are realistic and exciting. The road worry is not deep into characterizations and plot as far as that goes. It makes up for that in other areas. On my rating scale, the road warrior rates a seven. The environment in this film is not a good one. It's brutal and violent, and because of that, this movie is not for everyone. There are not good guys and bad guys, only bad, semi-bad, and forget it. Max's character is a futuristic loner, a gunfighter of sorts battling the bad guys. For suspense, quick action, and fantastic stunts, Road Warrior is the one to see. The future takes on a whole new perspective after seeing this movie. I'm Dean O'Lolly. My favorite year is a fun-filled, loaded-with-laughs comedy that stands out above the rest of the movie crowd. It should do well at the box office. It's about the early days of television. My favorite year is specifically 1954, the place, the NBC studios in New York. Peter O'Toole plays a movie star, a hard-drinking matinee screen idol, Alan Swan. He likes blondes and booze, not necessarily in that order. O'Toole's character is in the mold of Errol Flynn. O'Toole is set to appear on the comedy Cavalcade show, much like the old year show of shows. Since O'Toole has this problem with the booze, he is put under the supervision of one of the show's young comedy writers, Mark Lynn Baker. Baker is to make sure his idol, O'Toole, is at all the rehearsals and performance, sober of course. O'Toole's first appearance before the show staff is rather unusual. He shows up in his favorite condition. God, it's Renfield. I thought he was dead. Oops. There he is. Very good with the sword, though. It's a cough. Could be out of mush. Good morrow to you, ladies and gentlemen. He's plastered. If I were truly plastered, could I do this? Send a boomicelli. Would you have my sword? That could be dangerous and very painful. O'Toole does I behave himself for a few days. He endures some very funny moments, one of which is a dinner heart. party at Baker's house. Uh, something to drink before dinner? Um, some soda water. Rocky! A glass of seltzer! No, thank you. I'll be driving here. Now, talk about falling off the wagon. O'Toole falls way off. He goes on a big binge, and it's here the picture accelerates to an even more frantic and frenzied pace. The action takes another leap forward when O'Toole finds out his performance is going to be live before millions of viewers. He comes down with a severe case of stage fright and proclaims, I'm not an actor, I'm a movie star. My favorite year gives us a hilarious picture of the show's staff. The comedy cavalcade star, Joseph Bologna, writers Bill Macy, Anne DeSalvo, and Basil Hoffman. 
Lainey Kazan as Baker's mother is wonderful. The film's romantic action is between Jessica Harper and Baker. O'Toole's performance is great. His comic timing is flawless. Baker is very believable and puts in an excellent screen debut. Richard Benjamin's directorial debut is right on target. On my rating scale, my favorite year rates a well-deserved eight. With entertaining performances and first-rate directing, this movie is lots of fun. My favorite year is now one of my favorite movies. I'm Dino Lolly. Full of excitement, suspense, beautiful scenery and photography, and fine performances, Mother Load is a very good film I recommend you see. It's a modern day adventure story about man's lust and search for gold. It has all the ingredients that make it an impressive movie. It has foul play, plot twist, good acting and directing, the whole routine. The lead role goes to that great veteran actor, Charlton Heston. The part of Silas McGee in Old Crusty Scots Minor is something different for him. The film sets the pace when we learn that Nick Mancuso's friend, Rick Zantolis, disappears in the mountains. Rick thinks Ricky has gone up there to find the mother load. Kim Basinger accompanies Mancuso up to the spot where Ricky was last seen, but something unexpected happens to them. Their plane crashes and now they are marooned in the mountains. They do come across John Marley portraying a river Indian in the wilderness. He knows the way of the woods, but he doesn't tell them much of anything. Later, our two investigators run into Heston, a very protective miner. He convinces them his mine only produces silver and not gold. Mancuso questions Heston about his lost friend. They have many confrontations, with Heston finally telling him, You stay the hell out of my mine, laddie. That's one way to get out of a mine. This is one of those movies where I can't give too much away, but I will tell you the film does have some minor flaws. One of which is with a perfect situation for romance between Nick and Basinger, nothing happens. And it seems Mancuso has this uncanny ability to fully recover from all the scraps he gets into. Charlton Heston's directing is very good. He keeps the pace moving quickly. The performances are all impressive, particularly Heston's and Basinger's. On my rating scale, Mother Load is going to get a seven. Even with its flaws, Mother Load stands out as one of those crowd-pleasing films. It's relatively free of obscene language, so for an old-fashioned adventure, see Mother Load. You won't strike it rich with this movie, but you will get your money's worth. I'm Dino Lolly. I'm sorry to say that most of the newer films out right now are not that good, so on my recommendations for the weekend, I have to stay with the more established movies that have been playing for a while. The first being My Favorite Year. It's a very funny film set against the frantic and hectic world of a live TV comedy show in the 1950s. A young comedy writer, Mark Lynn Baker, is assigned watchdog duties over his idol, a star named Alan Swan, wonderfully played by Peter O'Toole. O'Toole is untrustworthy and is a drunk on the grandest scale. The events that follow are delightfully funny. Rated PG, my favorite year rates an eight. Mother Load is a good adventurous film. It's about man's ageless lust for gold. It has lots of action and suspense, good acting and directing, starring Charlton Heston and Nick Mancuso. Mother Load rates a seven. Sylvester Stallone's latest film, First Blood, is interesting, but not without flaws. It's one of those good and bad films. Stallone stars as a former Green Beret at war with a small town police force. This movie is very bloody and violent. Rated R for very good reasons, First Blood rates a five. I don't think you understand. Oh, yes, I do. Those are my selections for weekend movie viewing. Until next Thursday night, I'm Dino Lolly.
<laughs> what brings you to town is you're promoting the Mitzi Gaynor Show, uh -huh. which will be in Oklahoma City November the 11th through uh -huh. the 14th. Right. Five performances only. Yes. How many hours of rehearsal do go into a show like this? Well, to prepare or mm -hmm. uh, on the preparing. hoof? Okay. Um, it takes us to put it together. It takes about a month to put it together. That's mm -hmm. with costumes being made and that's rehearsal uh, from like 10 to 5 every day. We've got a quick tape, about 30 seconds worth. Let's take a look at oh, it and just see, see how you look. Okay. <laughs> You look fabulous. You are just, you're just fantastic. Why, thank you, darling. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> now, there, are, there are nine men in the show, right? Nine, count them. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Now, this is also going to be at the Civic Center. Civic Center, yes. Okay, where can you buy tickets? Uh, you can buy them uh, at Brown's, mm -hmm. uh-huh, and you can buy them at my hotel if you'd like to stop by. <laughs> are you going to be in the lobby? I'm going to be in the lobby behind a little <laughs> desk saying, please come and buy the tickets. Uh -huh. And I believe it's at the at Carson Attractions you can buy those, too. You're always on the move. Where do you get all this energy? Oh, gosh. I suppose I'm born with it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a Hungarian, a hunky. Uh -huh. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> and Italian, we go together well. That's, fine. That's right. So being Hungarian is almost as good as being Italian. I know if there are any Hungarians that are going like that. Um, I just was born with it. I you have had such a, a great career. You know, you've been in some wonderful movies. I'm gonna uh, something I just now thought about. I'm gonna throw out some people you've worked with. Okay. And if you can give me a quick synopsis of what it was like to work with them. All right. David Niven. Perfect. Perfect in every way. If he was here with us right now, we'd be on the floor laughing. He has so many wonderful stories. Women love him just as much as men do. He's an Academy Award winner, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, I adore him. A fellow Italian, Frank Sinatra. Ma! <laughs> Frank is so civilized. I adored working with him in The Joker's Wild because we didn't start work until noon and we finished at 8 o'clock, which is mm -hmm. just like a civilized person would work. Uh -huh. well, you, you are a lovely lady, and what? I really mean that sincerely. Well, thank you for taking time to visit with I've us. really enjoyed this. Thanks, Dino. Uh-huh. This. Thanks, Dino. Uh-huh. Heaven only knows what the filmmakers were thinking when they were making Monsignor. And as for the actors, well, Christopher Reeve should stick to flying. I tell you what the makers of Monsignor should have done. That's combine a couple of things. Now, Reeve has played Superman, right? Well, in Monsignor, he's a priest, later a cardinal. They should have turned the whole thing into a comedy. And the title? Well, we had the flying nun once before. How about the flying cardinal? Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? Here's the premise. Christopher Reeve plays Father Flaherty. The film starts with Reeve as a young army chaplain in World War II. An incident happens in which Reeve guns down a bunch of German soldiers. Well, that attracts the attention of the Vatican and its officials. They think he's got spunk. Well, he's got spunk, all right, but later he's going to have lots of problems. Reeve's you, mentor right. is Fernando Rey. He's the Pope's right-hand man. Now, he but recognizes, along Rey with the other Vatican officials, Reeve's financial but genius. With Reeve's point. mafia connections and his close friendship with Rey, to help the church's financial problems, Reeve is given permission to work the black market. Then there is more trouble. Reeve is drawn into a strange love affair with a postulant nun, played by Genevieve Bujo. We never see a loving relationship, and as one person put it, the two, I don't want to be in this crummy movie anymore. In most of the scenes between the two, you want to laugh. They're so hokey. There are many, many flaws in Monsignor. For instance, historically, the film is wrong in its portrayal of the Pope. There are unusual and disjointed time changes. There is no sense of direction. You don't know what the film is saying. The script is full of cliches, and its tone of high camp is ridiculous. Christopher Reeve's performance is boring. The only standout is Jason Miller as a mafia chief. Now, on my rating scale, Monsignor rates only a four. The potential for a powerful and gripping drama is there, but it's never developed. There's no motivation or climax in the movie. It's illogical and most of the time just plain boring. A film that appears not to have any blessings from anyone, Monsignor really needs divine intervention. I'm Dino Lolly. Uh, what was it like doing the, uh, the, the Waltons? Such a marvelous show. Well, that really was the aristocrat of the television series.
Mm -hmm. And it was very rewarding being involved in it, with it mm -hmm. because um, it, the scripts were excellent mm -hmm. and I had a wonderful part. Mm -hmm. And um, it made a very strong impression. People either could stand me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be on escalators, you know, going places. I would be going up and people on the other side would be going down. They'd say, I can't stand you. <laughs> I said, wait, but wait. <laughs> Let me explain. Let me explain. <laughs> but a lot of people then would get that part and they would be touched by it because mm -hmm. they would give her redeemable qualities mm -hmm. from time to time, make her funny. Do you have a preference for the stage or for television? I have a preference financially for television. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but the theater is more rewarding because uh, it's, it's, you can gauge the response immediately. Mm -hmm. And it's also very intimate. A play should be as demanding on the audience, intellectually, as it is on the performer. You should come away having learned something. And you, you, a good play, you have to stay with it. Mm -hmm. Like Shaw, you can't let your mind wander. You have to, he demands of you, of an audience, that you listen. Mm -hmm. And that makes it, um, of course, of course, much more rewarding. Acting opposite Richard Kiley in the 34th story, you won an award. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, that was the Cowboy Hall of Fame yes. award. When, when was this? That, uh, um, it was uh, the centennial, the year mm -hmm. of the centennial. And what was that like when you first received word that you had won this? Oh, I was delighted. I, I was just delighted because, because I thought it was an excellent uh, script. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was just uh, very pleased to be involved in that. What do you have coming up in the future? Well, I am producing this play by Jack Hefner, mm -hmm. who wrote Vanities, mm -hmm. with my, and there are only two characters in it, uh, myself and my friend Fanny Flagg. You are a wonderful actress. Thank and a, you very much. a lovely lady. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's been a pleasure for me to talk to you. Thank you. you. I've I hope enjoyed you come it. Back to Oklahoma more often. Well, thank you very much. I hope so too. The Man from Snowy River is a very good film. It's an exciting adventure saga that has wonderful acting and directing. And when it comes to breathtaking photography, this film will be at the top. It's the story of a boy from Australia and how he becomes a man. A mystical, almost mythical stallion is at the heart of this lavishly produced film. Starring Kirk Douglas, I highly great. recommend The Man from Snowy River. Rated PG, it's great viewing for the oh, entire family, and I rated a nine. If you're looking for a comedy, see The Missionary. Michael Palin stars as a not-so-righteous minister sent to London's Red Light District to save the souls of fallen women. But not everything goes according to his plan, and he becomes more involved, so to speak. This movie does have its very funny moments, but it is not without its slow spots and overall flaws. But it is different, and everyone puts in a fine performance. They rate it R, I rate it 6. And if it's violence you want, First Blood will give you a pint full. Sylvester Stallone stars as a disillusioned Vietnam veteran pitted against a small town police department and the National Guard. First Blood is rated R, and I will give it a five. And that's it for now. I'll see you next Thursday night when I will pick the flicks. I'm Dino Lolly. How was being born and raised in Oklahoma advantageous to your career? Well, I got the best fine arts training you can get anywhere. I mean, I, I pity people who are born in other parts of the country because they cannot possibly know what it's like to study uh, music and dancing, voice and drama in an area where they care so much about the arts. Mm -hmm. I had the best training anyone could get. You've also appeared in Jesus Christ Superstar. I did Mary Magdalene mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in the concert tour of a Superstar. I was in the chorus in the Broadway show. And, uh, oh, that was a wonderful, wonderful role. Really Prepared me to play Donna on all my children, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your character Donna like? Well, I love her, first of all. I think she's one of the best characters ever written for daytime or anywhere. She's ditzy, certainly, but she has a, a deep feeling heart, and she's very sensitive. Mm -hmm. And when she loves someone, She's loyal to that person to the death. Uh, most of your uh, 
most of your viewers who are traitors to, <laughs> to this network will know by now that, uh, that Estelle has died in the car wreck. And I'm sure that will color Donna's life from now on. Mm -hmm. I do know that when I go back to work this coming Monday, mm -hmm. uh, Donna delivers her baby. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, and I have Monday's script. So I know what happens Monday. I don't know what happens after the baby's born. Now, what do you like to do when it comes time to relax and get away from work for a while? I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Back, I'm on my vacation this week. Mm -hmm. I've been to North Carolina, Dallas, Los Angeles, Lawton, Oklahoma City. Tonight I go to Stillwater and tomorrow back to Oklahoma City. And Sunday I go back and put on my pregnant suit for work. <laughs> <laughs> One what? more show in that thing. What are you going to be doing in Saturday Night Show for the Diamond Jubilee? I'll be Saturday singing. Night. I'll talk a little about being from Oklahoma, which I do anyway, wherever I go. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can see my necklace. Fancy. I always wear this, and uh, I always, I'm very proud of being from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I, I have a house in Lawton, and I go back quite often, uh, stay at my parents' home. Uh -huh. Well, I'll tell you, Oklahomans are very proud of you. Oh, thank you, Dino. We really enjoy you for you coming back, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what happens next week. Oh, yeah. And Do. We'll, and we'll see you Saturday night. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some people just can't leave well enough alone. The original Halloween film was great. Halloween 2 was all right. But Halloween 3... You don't really know much about Halloween. I know enough that I'm not recommending this stupid movie. In the filmmaker's defense, I will say Halloween 3 does not have anything in common with its two predecessors besides the obvious. In this third go-around, it's a totally different story, different characters, the whole bit. You've got a crazed toy manufacturer who specializes in making Halloween masks. After strange goings-on, a doctor and a daughter of one of the victims of this Halloween ritual look for some answers. Well, they find some, all right, but it almost backfires on both of them. Here, the, the toy manufacturer, Dan O'Herlihy, explains to Tom Atkins. Halloween. The festival of Samhain. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red with the blood of animals and children. Sacrifices are part of our world, our craft. Which craft? To us, it was a way of controlling our environment. It's not so different now. It's time again. It's time to stop making these stupid and asinine movies. Now, on my rating scale, Halloween 3 doesn't even get a 3, but it gets a 1, and that's pushing it some. The acting, directing, the script are all bad. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, shouldn't be seen in any season. I'm Dino Lolly. Alright, First Blood is one of those half and half films. Some of it is good and some of it is bad. It's also one of those films that after you walk out, you're asking the question, what is this movie trying to say? Now I think that's one of the problems. It's trying to say too many things at once. First Blood stars Sylvester Stallone as a once heroic Green Beret, John Rambo. Rambo is the last of an elite corps of killers. He's a war hero, a Congressional Medal of Honor winning killing machine. Stallone, now a drifter, arrives in this small mountainous town, ironically named Hope, Oregon. Stallone is unshaven and he's looking pretty grungy. The sheriff, played by Brian Denny, does not get a good impression of Stallone. In fact, although Stallone asks where he can eat in the town, Denny tells him to look someplace else. This upsets Stallone and soon he's arrested for vagrancy. When he's taken to jail, he's roughed up by some of the police officials who are aggravated by Stallone's unpleasant manners. Stallone retaliates and what pursues is a great fight scene and the war is on. Stallone escapes into the woods. Now, it's there he's right at home, but very powerful and dangerous. Soon, the whole National Guard is out after him. Later, Strictly Richard Crenna shows up as Stallone's old Green Beret yeah, commanding easy. officer. He trains Stallone. He says he's not there to save Girl, him, but to save the National Guard who are in his pursuit. You don't seem to want to accept the fact that you're dealing with an expert in guerrilla warfare, with a man who's the best, with guns, with knives, with his bare hands, a man who's been trained to ignore pain. Ignore weather, to live off the land, to eat things and to make a billy goat puke. 
In Vietnam, his job was to dispose of enemy personnel. To kill. Period. Win by attrition. Well, Rambo was the best. You know, we're just a small, hick town sheriff's department, Colonel, but we're expected to do our duty, just like our heroes in the Special Forces. In Special Forces, we teach our people to stay alive in the line of duty. I never thought of that. You want a war you can't win? Are you telling me that 200 men against your boy is a no-win situation for us? You send that many, don't forget one thing. What? A good supply of body bags. Well, not that many body bags are needed, but at this point, you start to wonder about the believability of the whole thing. Now, let me tell you the good and bad points. The good, the editing is excellent, the whole film is fast-paced and has lots of action. Ted Kotcheff's directing is impressive. The actors all do a fine job. Now, the bad points, at times it's hard to care about Stallone's character because we know so little about him. He's not developed at all. It seems most of the time he's simply a whacked-out psycho. On my rating scale, First Blood rates a 5. Sly doesn't have a lot of lines, but it doesn't matter. Although First Blood is a little anemic, it is possible not to like the movie and admire it at the same time. It is bloody and violent, so be aware. You might need a transfusion later. I'm Dean O'Lolly. At what age did you say, I want to be a singer? Oh, it was about five years ago. You want me to figure out my age? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a well, well, just... Uh... Uh, my sister had a lot of faith in me, and she kept saying, Louise, you have an entertainer inside of you, and you should be out entertaining. And finally, I thought, well, I'll never know if I don't try. And that was five years ago. And then two years ago, she put her little sisters on national television. You come from a musical family. What was it like growing up in that type of environment? Well, um, in the beginning years, Barbara's always known that music uh, is what she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I just waited to be told. Uh, I can remember Christmases when we didn't know how to do anything except Barbara would choreograph a skipping routine while she'd play the organ, Erlene and I would skip, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, then as we grew up, my sister was in uh, Vietnam in 65, along with my parents entertaining the troops, and it it was at that time that I turned my little sister and said, this is it, we're not going to be left at home anymore. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. started learning to play instruments. How many instruments do you play now? Too many to two. <laughs> 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 my band does not appreciate uh, my talents. <laughs> uh, um, I try to change them every year, so no one will know what to expect. My road show is different. Mm -hmm. I change it, oh, at least by March of every year. Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, you, your husband RC, yes. Uh, started performing with you. What is, what is that like? Well, he's not on the road with me. Uh, for the re He just finished his last date with me this year. Mm -hmm. I enjoy RC being on the road. Uh, naturally, anybody who's married would prefer their uh, husband or wife be with him. But mm -hmm. in RC's case, since he's a songwriter, he can't always be there. He Do you ever worry about the fact that when you have a concert, people will come to see you because you're Barbara's sister and, and not Louise Mandrell? Do you lose any individuality in that? I used to, but I've never minded why they come. Just mm -hmm. buy your tickets. Just buy your tickets. Because I will promise you, I will entertain you when you get there. Uh, but now, they, thanks to Barbara, they mm -hmm. know who I am. Do you and Barbara ever compare yourselves? Uh, no, but we try to help each other. Uh, that sounds funny coming from this side to that side because Barbara's taught me so much, and we're not, but we're not alike. So when I sit back and I watch her show, I, I can be constructive, and when she sits back and watches mine, mm -hmm. she can be constructive. We're probably the only two people that could tell each other what's wrong with the show with, without, you know, the defenses coming up, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's so much love there. You are a very lovely and talented lady, and Thank it's you. been a pleasure for me to talk with you. Thank you.